So, economics. It's one of the most well-respected areas of research in the world. It forms the backbone of our political system, our capitalist society, and, well, the economy. But what if I was to tell you that one of the most fundamental concepts in economics is flawed? And we know it's flawed because of research in the area of study that I specialize in, behavioral economics. That fundamental concept I'm talking about is incentives. It's at the heart of economic theory. It's the simple idea that if you want someone to do something, you pay them. And paying people motivates them to do that thing more, and the more you pay them, the more motivated they should be. And on the flip side, but still within the umbrella of incentives, there's fines. Fines are also a type of incentive, but a negative one. If you don't want someone to do something, you fine them. You make doing that thing expensive for the person doing it, and that makes them less likely to do it. It's all very logical. It makes sense to us, right? And to be fair to economists, this is true in a lot of different scenarios. But it's not universal across all human behavior. And there are many very important exceptions to this rule that I want to talk about in today's video. So in today's video, I'm going to tell you about two studies in behavioral economics that look at incentives from a different point of view to classical economics. And hopefully this will show you that incentives aren't as straightforward as just paying people to do stuff. And really you have to understand the market a lot better before you introduce this very powerful tool. So let's talk about incentives. <laughs> Okay, so this first study was done by two researchers in Israel who were spending some time doing research at a daycare. At this daycare, they were monitoring the pickup times of the children from the daycare. This particular daycare finished the day at 4 p.m., so that's when parents were supposed to arrive to pick up their kids. And being late, well, being late was really rude because it meant that the teachers had to stay behind, look after their kids in their own time. So it was kind of a socially expected thing that parents should show up at 4 p.m. to pick up their kids on time. But what the researchers found while at this daycare was that parents would often show up late to pick up their kids. So the researchers thought this was a really great opportunity to test this very fundamental concept in economics of fines. Parents are showing up late to pick up their kids. That's an undesirable behavior, so they introduced a small fine. Now, according to economic theory, you'll remember, a fine should reduce the amount of people who do a certain behavior. After all, they used to get away with this behavior for free, but now there's a cost associated with it, so less people should be willing to do it. But the opposite is what the researchers ended up finding. When they introduced this small fine, more parents showed up late to pick up their kids than before. Now this is really weird and totally contradictory to the predictive models of economic theory. So what was going on here? Well, the researchers hypothesized that when they introduced this fine, parents switched their mindset from, I need to show up on time to pick up my kids because I don't wanna be that person who makes those teachers stay late after the hours that they were paid for, to, now I feel justified in showing up late to pick up my kids, so long as I pay the fine. Because of this, the researchers named their paper, A Fine is a Price, because in essence, this is what was happening. Parents of the daycare were treating the fine as a price, and they felt morally justified to show up late to pick up their kids, so long as they paid this small fee. Now, while that might be very interesting intellectually, it doesn't really solve the problem for this daycare. Now they've got more parents showing up late to pick up their kids, the problem is still a problem. So what do you do in the situation? Well, obviously, intuitively, you think, well, I'll just remove the fine again. If more people show up late when I have the fine, then let's take the fine away, then maybe it'll go back down at least to the levels that it was before. But this is where the study gets even more interesting, because when they took the fine away, those parents kept showing up late, but now they weren't paying a fine. What this suggests to us as behavioral economists is that the introduction of a fine, a financial incentive, switched the mindset of the parents who were supposed to show up on time to pick up their kids. It switched them from a market that was driven by social motivation, they wanted to be a good person and pick up their kids on time, to now being a purely financial one, where they think of this behavior of picking up their kids as something that they could just pay for, and now that the fine is gone, well great, they can get this service now for free. Now this is an extremely important finding. The researchers, Yuri and Aldo, they coined this phenomenon overcrowding. And they called it that because what they were saying 
was that the financial incentive overcrowds the initial motivation to be a socially responsible person. And this research is important because it shows us that you can't just throw incentives out and retract them willy-nilly. When you introduce an incentive to a socially driven market, the mindset of the people in that market then changes. And even if you remove the incentive afterwards, it becomes very difficult to bring people back to that kind of social mindset. Now, this is really important for companies and policymakers. If you want to shift the behavior of your citizens or your employees or even your customers, and you want to encourage more of a socially good behavior that you see some people doing already, you have to be aware that if you introduce an incentive in that scenario, then the people who used to do things out of like the goodness of their heart may suddenly stop doing those things once the incentive is removed. So if you're going to introduce an incentive to a market for the first time, you have to be very careful about how you do so and make sure you really understand the motivations of the market before you do it. So that was the first study on overcrowding that I wanted to share with you. But I now have a second study that I want to share with you about incentives that shows us that people don't just work for financial incentives, that there are other things that motivate us even when financial incentives are present. And so this is a study about bionicles and incentives. So this is one of my absolute favorite studies in all of behavioral economics. It was done by Dan Ariely, who's a super famous researcher in this field. And in this study, participants were asked to build bionicles, these kind of Lego figures. Now, the way that this experiment worked was that participants would be paid for each bionicle that they successfully made. For the first bionicle that they made, they were paid $2. And then for the second one, $189. And then for the third one, $178. And basically for every subsequent Bionicle that they made, they were paid 11 cents less than the previous Bionicle. Now that setup on its own is not particularly interesting, right? Like just seeing how many Bionicles people are willing to make for a very small amount of money. But what made this study interesting was that participants were sorted into two groups. They were called the Meaningful Group and the Sisyphus Group. Let's start with the Meaningful Group. So in the Meaningful Condition, participants would make a Bionicle and then after they completed one, the researcher would take that bionicle and put it on the side, fully complete and on display. And then they would ask them, do you want to build a second one? However, in the Sisyphus condition, participants still built a bionicle and were still asked if they wanted to build a second one. But as they were building the second one, the researcher would disassemble the first one that they just built in front of their eyes. And what the researchers were interested in finding out is would participants build the same number of bionicles in the meaningful condition and the Sisyphus condition. After all, the incentives are the same. Well, as you might expect, that wasn't the case. In the meaningful condition, participants on average built 11 Bionicles, but in the Sisyphus condition, the average was only seven. So the reason why this experiment is interesting is because the incentives were the same for both groups, financially speaking. So according to economic theory, these people should be equally motivated and should build the same number of Bionicles. However, we know as human beings that that's not really how people respond and that people respond to more than simple financial incentives. And this has a lot of implications for managing teams. If you're someone who employs other people, then it's important to understand that your employees are motivated by far more than just how much they get paid. Yes, of course, salary is important, but there are other things that people care about too, and those other things are often free and can have an even greater impact on people's motivation to work than salary alone. This Bionicle study shows us that people really care about having the work that they do being shown to others and being valued, whereas dismissing work that people have done before, well, that's extremely demotivating. And of course, the name of the demotivating condition is very appropriate the Sisyphus condition. If you don't know, Sisyphus was from ancient Greek myth. He was a king who got too arrogant and was punished by the gods for his hubris. Sisyphus' punishment was to push a boulder up a hill. He was told that if he could get the boulder to the very top of the hill, that he would be free of his punishment. But as he pushes the boulder up the hill, the boulder seems to get heavier and heavier to the point where he's almost at the very top of the hill and then his body gives way, the boulder is too much, and it rolls back down to the bottom for him to start over again. Having your boulder roll back down the hill is extremely demotivating, and using purely financial incentives to overcome that kind of demotivation is a very expensive way to overcome that. So I hope that your work gets appreciated, and I appreciate you for watching my work in making this video. Thank you so much for watching, 
and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.